Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first of the Hybrid Futures Talks, uh, part of the digital innovation season here at Central St. Martins, University of the Arts, London. I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you, and uh, thank you for joining us from wherever you are uh, to engage with us tonight uh, and to be provoked by ideas around uh, our relationship with technologies, uh, our encounters uh, with machines, uh, and the hybrid futures we are not just facing, but perhaps also wanting to build together. My name is Betty Marenko. I am a reader in Design and Techno-Digital Futures uh, at the University of the Arts London. I run the Contest Studies program, BA in Product and Industrial Design at Central St. Martins. Um, before we start with tonight's uh, session, a few words uh, on digital housekeeping. Uh, the session is recorded and the report is going to be available uh, later on on YouTube. Um, you're warmly invited to post a question as we go along uh, during uh, the talk. So for uh, our facilitator, Kay Tolland, uh, to relay um, at the end of uh, the talk. Um, um, audience uh, microphone and videos are disabled. And uh, in case of technical issues, uh, let's all uh, collectively be patient. <laughs> um, a few words about the RB Futures. Um, the purpose of this series of talks uh, is to illuminate uh, the impact of uh, technologies and digital technologies in particular on the human and the non-human uh, and the way in which our ways uh, of living, of working, of uh, thinking and feeling, of existing uh, are actually being, uh, are being profoundly transformed uh, by machines, uh, devices, platforms, uh, invisible but very tangible infrastructures as well. Now, technologies modify profoundly our cognitive, social, and uh, environmental habitat. Uh, they offer unprecedented opportunities uh, for communication, exchange, connectivity. But at the same time, uh, they raise uh, huge challenges. They exacerbate existing issues. They create new problems. For instance, digital governance. Uh, um, and all matters concerning privacy, control, surveillance, uh, from face recognition to algorithmic bias uh, to data harvesting. Uh, politics of extraction of resources that are both human, such as our time, our attention, our eyeballs and labor, but also are um, non-human, such as uh, the, the mineral like Colton, which are needed to power our smartphones. And then the, injust the injustice and the exploitation on a global scale to support the digital economies. The ethical question involved in the building of artificial intelligence. Asymmetrical access to the digital resources, but also more broadly, the kind of narratives, stories and mythologies we tell each other in, uh, in society about machines. And uh, finally, what counts for human intelligence and for humanity in a world populated by objects designed to be smart? So the Arbit Futures Talk series uh, want to ask questions around these issues uh, and function as a forum where we can discuss ways of building creative and uh, critical responses to the challenges technologies present today. And together with a series of skill-based workshop offered throughout the digital innovation season for Central St. Martin students, um, our aim is to bring together creative practices and critical thinking, not just to find a solution to pressing problems raised by technologies, but to ask important and difficult and perhaps uncomfortable questions about our relationship with technologies, uh, the technologies we have created, uh, about the futures we envision, uh, and now we can reimagine the encounter with machines. And this brings me to the title of the series, which is Hybrid uh, Futures. So why hybrid? Now the hybrid is a very vivid image uh, that illustrates uh, the coming together of different components to create something new, something that perhaps did not exist before, um, and that really illustrates the notion of the blurring of the boundaries. As a trope of reimagining the encounter of human and machine, it is an image with a formidable legacy, 
um, from Donna Haraway, um, cyber from the 90s, uh, to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, uh, and even earlier to the 18th century automata. And what do these images all have in common is that they're all sources of technological wonder, but also source of profound anxiety, all raising questions about uh, the boundaries between flesh and metal, between the organic and the inorganic, between the animate and the inanimate, ultimately all raising ontological questions about uh, the living and the non-living. And they're also very similar to the, the same question that we pose today around the artificial intelligence, around the singularity, and even in a more perhaps a trivial manner, the question that we might ask ourselves in our daily um, experience uh, of both having to adapt uh, to the needs of machines, uh, exactly as we're doing right now, as well as deploying machines as an indispensable extension of ourselves. So I like to think of the hybrid as a very eloquent metaphor uh, for how changes instigated by technological innovation have continuously redesigned the sense of self in relation to, but also in opposition to machines. So the hybrid becomes a situated, partial and never neutral rhetorical device, a figure of thought to provoke discussion about the behaviors, the expectation, and the narratives of the encounter human and machine. But there are a couple of points in particular um, concerning the way I envision the notion of the hybrid I'd like to draw your attention to. First of all, the hybrid has divergence, as hosting and holding divergence. Hybrid does not necessarily mean that different components merge into an ultimate fusion. On the contrary, what we'd like to emphasize here is the cohabitation of divergence without need or attempt or desire to recompose those differences or to erase them in a totality. There is no fusion, there is no totality. And following Isabel Stenger's divergence is never divergence from something or divergence between things, but is inherent to how things are and the radical difference. So in a sense, the hybrid uh, becomes a, a very spacious concept uh, that can literally open up uh, rooms for friction, for disharmony and even dissent. The second point concerning the hybrid is that uh, um, we don't see it uh, as a final product, uh, but rather as a process. So it would be more appropriate to talk about the process of hybridizations without a clear beginning and a clear outcome. And again, it is a way, um, hybridization, to think in terms of holding contradiction and holding unevenness. And rather than focusing only on what can be brought together to create an hybrid, we can also pay attention to what is left out, which is important if we want to grasp power dynamics and power structures. So hybridization is not about reconciling things uh, that are different or trying to make them fit, but rather it's an ongoing process. And this uh, brings me to the third point, uh, the notion of the hybrid as a metastable system. Certainly we don't pose hybrid in opposition to uh, um, a supposed notion of purity. There was never, there has never been any purity. And uh, as a philosopher of science, Peter Gallison uh, reminds us, uh, the notion of purity um, will never take us anywhere. Even our, our body uh, is constantly replacing uh, cellular material. So with enough change to keep us going and enough uh, stability to keep us recogn recognizing ourselves. So quasi-stability, meta-stability is what matters for the hybrid. And finally, if we think in terms of uh, holding divergence, uh, process, and metastability, then uh, we're, we are looking at the hybrid as uh, something whose, whose outcomes uh, cannot be fully predicted. And in this way, we enter a space of uncertainty. And here we have the hybrid uh, as, a, as a desire not to predict, uh, but to attune ourselves to the unknown, uh, to pay attention to the unknown and knocking at the door as uh, Gilles Deleuze wrote. Uh, and therefore to use speculation, anticipation, and certainly imagination to turn the unknown into a material to work with. And uh, this is the hybrid as also the, the sheer surprise uh, 
the wonder what defies expectations or what unhinges uh, established grooves uh, and can create a genuine novelty. So taken in this way, the notion of the hybrid becomes a portal. I like to see it as a portal to imagine different futures, uh, a multitude of potential futures, hybrid futures uh, that we can craft by bringing together creativity and criticality into practice. So our ambition with the digital innovation season and the hybrid futures thoughts is to use the hybrid as a critical lens to look at futures creatively, operating in the liminal space between disciplines, uh, across practices, defined taxonomies and labels. And we should not underestimate the power that the healthy dose of confusion of boundaries can produce, especially in times of polarization and re-entrenchment. So here's to the hybrid and hybrid futures as a mode of thinking, of practicing and existing that can resist reduction, counter, counteract the stifling of imagination and work instead to create a more, a more surprising unpredictable and productive divergence. And on that note, uh, I'm going to introduce our really special guest for tonight. I'm so delighted that Manu Lukci is here with us uh, and she's joining us from Vienna. Uh, Manu is resident artist at Somerset House and former Open Society Fellow. Uh, she's an artist and film director. Her practice interrogates conceptions of progress with a strong emphasis on research, participation, and new forms of engagement. Her films and artworks address the regulation of public space, the construction of independent media infrastructure, and widespread corporate data surveillance. She is the director of Dreams Rewired, which is screened as part of the digital innovation season. And I really hope that most of you had a chance to watch it. Um, and the major focus of Manu's work has been the data trace, the digital shadows cast by humans in networked space in the course of daily activities. And more recently, this focus has broadened to include algorithmic management as deployed in smart city context. Uh, Manu's work is included amongst other in the Collective Center Pompidou, the BFI National Archive, and the core collection at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Science. It is my pleasure now to introduce you, Manu and uh, her talk, Dreams Rewired. Thank you. You are ready to share your screen? Yeah, thank you, Betty, for this introduction. Uh, I'm going to share screen. Mm. There we go. So yeah, thank you also for having me here. I'm really delighted to be able to share my journey back into the past with you. I say back into the past because uh, we're going to revisit film material uh, that um, we used uh, to create uh, Dreams Rewired material from the very uh, beginning of moving images to the up to the 1930s and um, um, really I joined the, uh, the film team at a moment when the other, the other side of the coin, um, the price to pay for our wonderful constant um, state of being connected, which I call hyper-connected, um, was common knowledge. So we knew that um, uh, some, some forms of surveillance open up um, in this status of connectedness. And, and um, I wondered, why are we so committed to this um, condition of being connected? Is there something about the human condition that I need to understand what is this dream that we share. And it was also bef just before the release of Dreams Rewired uh, that the Snowden revelations became public in 2014. So by then um, uh, the question was even uh, more burning. Um, so Dreams Rewired sets out the emotional relationship to 
media and um, information technologies, um, the, the, the dreams that we share, the, the fears, or if you like the promises that um, these uh, technologies are um, radiating, the utopian promises, like our personal smart devices today. Um, going to change the slide. Um, um, uh, like our personal smart devices today, like early um, empowerment for people confronted with this form of acceleration um, and accelerated change um, that we also continue to experience today. So um, here I've got a few screenshots that show that these dreams are still being communicated um, within uh, the subtitles of some of the major platforms like stay connected and share life as it happens. So even though your friends um, are somewhere else, your family is somewhere else, um, you should continue to share your life. Um, you're heading out, stay connected. Um, so the, these, um, oops, sorry, I touched the wrong. <laughs> so, um, so these, um, 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 uh, you, uh, the changes that came through the electrification around uh, the, um, the end of the 19th century, they came hand in hand with a technological revolution and social reform that swept parts of Europe and America, recasting the domestic, the workplace, the industry. So, um, so elsewhere, the active colonialism um, intensified, of course, you know, we needed new, new materials were needed like um, um, rubber or uh, which was gained from um, gutta percha, a particular type of tree or copper, new materials. So really um, a utopia always claims uh, to bring change for everyone. But this question will continue to haunt us. Did this um, televisual utopia really deliver uh, this positive change, um, make it accessible for everyone. Um, so this electrification occurred within a broader context of modernization. Um, we can see innovation in the manufacturing of um, tools and uh, um, the tooling and the rise of petroleum and the, the chemical industries um, to medical advances precipitated by the new germ theories of diseases. Power stations were built and established in the 1880s, let's say, for example, in London and, and New York, and the invention of both the incandescent light bulb and the electric telephone um, arrived. So really, we're speaking about um, um, promises by mass media that Every, you know, everyone was hoping to benefit from not just the privileged and um, um, aristocratic classes that would profit from innovation in the past. Um, so this was the power behind these um, persuasive uh, um, new innovations, appliances, devices, um, communication channels. So the key transformation of the electric age is um, the overcoming of distance. And much of the technology was envisioned in early science fiction, uh, such as by uh, Albert Robitaille, a French um, author and um, cartoonist. So here we can see an illustration from his novel, uh, La Vie Electrique, uh, The Electric Life, um, that was published in 1890. And it's the story about um, a young woman, uh, the pro protagonist, um, Helen, who lives in a uh, in an electrified, gender equal uh, world full of uh, new, transformed by, by new inventions like the telephonoscope, which we can see here, uh, or aerotransport and other 
um, innovations that electricity brings. So, so we can see the uh, this man is somewhere in the in the colonies, and through this device that can transmit images, um, he uh, is in contact with most probably his wife and his children uh, back in France. But such radical visions mm, were driven by no less radical transformations of everyday life. Like a reliable undersea transatlantic link was established in 1866. And this cable carried an eight words per minute um, telegraph service. So you can imagine this brought New York and London really much closer because until that point, um, it took nine days to transport a message from London to New York. That was the speed of a steamer. Mm -hmm. So there I have also a quiz for you and whoever can answer that by the end of the talk or the first person can answer it. I promise to send a film poster if you care about. So if you have a message um, uh, on a steamer that takes nine days to travel, but telegraph can transport eight words I mean, how long does a message need to be? So out of how many words does it need to consist in order for the message that is transmitted by the telegraph to take as long as the message that is sent by the steamer, which was nine days. <laughs> so maybe you can um, figure that out. Uh, so an increase in communication speed of that order, because it was like 10,000 fold, was unprecedented and would not be seen again until the 1990s, which was when it hit me when I witnessed the arrival of the internet modem. And again, with it came this sense of... Uh, acceleration and yeah here if this these were a few more um, uh, illustrations from science fiction pamphlets um, of course these devices were imagined to be two-way uh, devices and also with the hope to be connected fears also creeped in that the privacy of your own home uh, so like in this case, you see a lady calling a man who is taking a bath and he looks rather surprised uh, to be broadcasted. So the following clip um, that I will show you captures uh, this uh, sense of acceleration, but also how the arrival of the telephone um, gives way to, um, yeah, to further imaginations because really people thought it's just a question of time until images will join words over wires. Geography is history. A new electric intimacy. Once we spanned a hundred meters with a shout. Now we bridge the globe with a whisper. Wanted. Young educated ladies. A workplace for women opens up. Operators guide bodiless voices through the network, smoothing over the crackles on the line. Men are just too impatient, too rude for the job. The flood threatens. Nervous breakdown? Adrenaline rush. Oh, I wish you'd leave me alone so I can get on the phone. Go on, off you go. 
Okay, call waiting? Yes, well, back to me. Well, I'm jolly and magnificently endowed. <laughs> Ooh, I like the sound of that. I'd like to see you with my own eyes. Well, meet me at two at the zoo, you frisky young buck. <laughs> and so that we know each other, why don't we... Uh, I don't know, wave a handkerchief. <laughs> Ooh, that's wonderful. Flag of love. Lols, lols. Surrender to the lure of the voice. She's got them at her beck and call. But some are far less handsome in the flesh. If only she could see them beforehand. Look up before the hookup. If carbon granules can transmit speech, then why not pictures? No more blind dates. No more longing for a face. Just imagine. Every home linked to every other. Having everything on demand? Never missing a magic moment? Being everywhere at once mm. the globe shrunk to the size of a village neighbors united in electric dreams So this um, electric telescope that um, we saw in the excerpt of Dreams of Wired, um, that is found in uh, many fiction films in early cinema and can be seen as a kind of a core device uh, that uh, announces dreams of um, um, this televisual utopia. However, um, it still... Uh, the, the existing hierarchies and prejudices, they continued, in particular of race. Utopias are, like I mentioned, initially often criticized for, uh, their, uh, for their claim to be all inclusive. Um, and so here again, we hit the limit. So um, in this Danish film, uh, the author is unknown, but um, we know that it's from 1908. We have the Danish title, it's Dr. Amstram Grams Kikert. <laughs> um, uh, there an European inventor awaits a guest who he wants to show the telescope. Um, meanwhile, the Asian servant uh, sneaks a look for the eyepiece and he can also rewind and fast forward. So this uh, telescope uh, is usually also a, a time machine of some sort, mm, but it's a one-way instrument. Yeah? So the, perceived superiority of the Western civilization is then later also mirrored um, in the humiliation through this inventor of, um, of his servant when he catches him using uh, the, the, the telescope. Um, so where do we stand today with remote seeing. In the, in the voice of the narration uh, that was then uh, delivered by Tilda Swinton, uh, we worked on this um, bridging effect, not to name any year numbers, not to name any names, um, as in to open up the, the narrative, to let the dream arc from the past 
the present and possibly points into um, in one into one of our futures. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there are uh, governmental initiatives, but also corporate um, services um, um, using reconnaissance drones and Earth observation satellites. Um, so they take remote seeing and the surveillance stance to new extremes. They image the globe in near real time. Rewinding history is as simple as traveling through the archives of these imaging services. But on the other hand, fast forwarding the future, that is possible through computer extrapolations that produce, for example, weather forecasts, weather projections. Um, so there are also other, um, maybe um, ethically more uh, provocative and um, unresolved applications um, of um, an exploitation of this, um, of today's possibility of um, live remote seeing. So this screenshot is actually from 2009 when a UK startup, Internet Eyes, proposed that for a small fee, um, retail, could um, hire, uh, uh, could like put their surveillance cameras, their streams online, and internet users uh, um, uh, would watch these uh, keen to catch a cash reward. So here you could sign up as a as a viewer, and you could also sign up as a as a customer. And this same concept was also picked up by the US uh, border authorities. Um, um, they offered also lay uh, to survey layers from the US Mexican border to help to catch and identify real time. Um, uh, um, uh, people trying to, to cross the border into the US. Mm. So there's maybe a space um, um, for discussion later <laughs> um, yeah, um, where we see that uh, yeah, the responsibilities and the limits of dignity being pushed by these um, applications. So around the same time, advances were also made in wireless. Um, so Marconi patented um, wireless um, 1900, or a little bit earlier. And um, this technology led to cable-free transatlantic communications just five years later. And needless to say, it also took the public imagination one step further. So wireless, it had these kind of magical qualities of an um, invisible force and power that could affect um, uh, send sound, for example, over distance. So, so this fantasy of a, a remote control uh, became also quite common then in, in um, early cinema. Mm. And it also sparked a a new wave of do-it-yourself culture around the possibilities of, um, of wireless. Oh, yeah. So here, um, uh, if you don't want to go shopping this Christmas, there's an instruction manual from 1916, how to make one just like it yourself. So you can make your own wirelessly remote <laughs> uh, pet dog for this uh, uh, years uh, as a Christmas gift. Mountains <laughs> and mountains. The receiver translates the signal into pulses of sound. Conversations in code. Coherers brought together. An end to isolation.
Socialites pick up on the city's chatter. I can't believe you haven't heard it yet. Oh, m mine isn't working. I couldn't survive a day without this. Check out the remix, y'all. Uh, uh, so the animation from the last film that uh, was quoted in this excerpt is uh, an animation by Luc Seal uh, and the slap, this remote slap um, that the Cella's wife conducts through wireless and the same time intimate and remote finds its darkest contemporary expression in the military drone strike. So remotely controlled and unmanned aerial vehicles, the UAVs, have a long and sinister history, beginning with their conception in the mid 19th century. So the 21st century weapon systems make ample use of UAV technology and not always in the context of war. The, US government has deployed armed drones in thousands of targeted killings. I'm putting my hands up for quotes, <laughs> um, uh, which are nothing else than extra judicial assassinations. Um, so yeah, really thousands since 2001, and even marking one, one of its own citizens um, for, again, quotes, termination in 2010. Drone wars are played out in an aggressively asymmetrical theater directed by joystick warriors um, uh, in the windowless um, ultimate gaming setup uh, far from the conflict zone. And in a future in which agents of war, fully autonomous killer robots, accountability will be even murkier. So in the last example that I would like to highlight um, uh, from this um, uh, research and findings um, that happened during the making of Dreams Rewired, I'd like to discuss how the historical enclosure of the electromagnetic commons um, in the US uh, mirrored really today's battle over uh, net neutrality. So net, yeah, um, okay, I get there later. So let's start again with the, um, uh, let's return to the, the radio amateurs. Ne? Beginning of 1900, 1910, that was really when radio amateurs exploited that um, media fully. It could be built by even young people. And um, um, if um, a tool to unite the, different nations in the new different Soviet Union to connecting young people in the remote American countryside, um, yeah, it really took off. So in the States, radio amateurs dominated the airwaves. Um, commercial and military use accounted for less than a quarter of the traffic. 
and large metropolitan areas um, in the US, they would each have like several hundred um, amateur stations. And a major commercial application of radio telegraphy was shipped to shore communication. So the radio rooms of luxury liners, um, they were designed primarily to serve wealthy passengers. Uh, messages back to shore with emergency communications as a useful byproduct. Uh, so uh, the controversial role which was then played by radio telegraphy in the 1912 sinking of the Titanic, subsequent rescue operations that showed up arguments spending of the, um, so yeah, it was believed that the Titanic operator was distracted by um, amateur, by radio amateurs, and hence um, um, the emergency call uh, yeah, couldn't be picked up in time. So, um, so yeah, the, this was a common narrative, and that led to um, legislation establishing new standards for radio, both maritime and land based. So, in the USA, then in just a year later, 1912, uh, the Radio Act did not deny new uh, station success, but as the radio advertisement grew, existing stations had no interest in sharing valuable airwaves with newcomers. So there we see um, a new media um, that had reached uh, momentum being consolidated and and um, being wrecked um, for the purpose of commercial and also military use. In the Europe, we saw a different development. This um, um, radio was nationalized and outruled um, um, as a national radio service. Mm. Um, yeah, probably best uh, illustrated uh, by a brief clip. Uh -huh, yeah. So here we see one more uh, variation of a um, uh, fan of wireless radio. So it says the most compact radio receiving set that has made its appearance is built on the bowl of a corn cob pipe. Mm. So yeah, these radio amateur magazines um, were very popular at the time and sharing these kind of news items. With the sinking of the Titanic, any hope for open communication by wireless is lost too. Rumors that radio enthusiasts jammed the ship's distress signals turn public opinion. Government regulation stifles amateur culture. Military and commercial interests occupy most of the spectrum. We are left only the shortwave band. Transmission becomes a privilege, not a right. Official stations broadcast to an eager public, synchronizing and uniting the nation. Achtung, Achtung! Hier ist die Sendestelle Berlin, im Buxhaus, auf Welle 400 Meter. Meine Damen und Herren, 
Wir machen Ihnen davon Mitteilung, dass am heutigen Tage der Unterhaltung Rundfunkdienst mit Verbreitung von Musikvorführungen auf drahtlos telefonischem Wege beginnt. Die Benutzung ist genehmigungspflichtig. Songs of Liberation Broadcast across the land and the entire planet. Local stations networked to create a mass market. Huge audiences sold to advertisers. A radio in every home. Yeah, so in um, his book, The Master Switch, The Rise and Fall of uh, Information Empires, Tim Wu, who's an academic based at Columbia Law School, he characterizes uh, the um, history of um, information systems by describing um, their movement as cyclic with open structures becoming consolidated and closed over time, reopening only after disruptive innovation. Um, um, I was yeah, kind of lending on this or, or inspired uh, by this um, uh, viewpoint when I structured the script for Dreams Rewired where you will be taken um, through eight of these uh, kind of cyclic developments. So the book outlines how network and media monopolies and governments make cozy bedfellows. <laughs> so having myself family in, in Italy, I could see um, Silvio Berlusconi, a media beggar turning prime minister. And then when I spent um, a year in Thailand as a student, Again, Taksin Shinawatra, uh, another media mogul turning prime minister and then um, kind of um, starting an uh, yeah, uh, different kind of relation media truth, uh, play, this deaf governing two of the more bizarre players to emerge from this nexus of expediency and we have also seen more recent developments taking this to, to new extremes. And in the Snowden revelations, the same cyclical pattern arises in right? the compliance of the major internet companies uh, with the US state that leads to the elimination of um, dissident voices, something my next film will look into. So uh, yeah, similar, sim similarly, you know, the internet is, is um, built on shared open technical standards, but commercial and legal superstructure now threaten to create differential regimes of access. Peer to peer and open models have again arisen with the digital networks and computing, but um, um, th there are tendencies uh, by um, ISPs to um, introduce um, a, a layering, a staggering of, um, of um, internet usage. So, um, and um, uh, yeah, so this is what the uh, proponents of uh, net um, equality are trying to prevent, that, for example, more bandwidth would be given to Netflix or less bandwidth would be given to someone who wants to run his own server to host his own creations and do his own or her own content publishing. So, so asymmetrical connectivity runs counter to, the, to this um, principle of uh, network neutrality that was introduced by Wu and is currently being battled over in the US. So the, the film is of course very motivated by um, um, the, the acknowledgement that all of us <laughs> need the awareness, need to feel this thing in order to get out of our mobile phone comfort zone, to start actively questioning um, these developments that have led again to a certain closure um, of the networks that have become part of our daily use. And so hopefully the film informs and mobilizes in this direction. 
Um, I um, was quite ambitious in my abstract and wanted to touch upon many more of these um, um, the, oops, developments. Um, however, I'm not sure how we're doing with time, but um, I thought I just announced that uh, the essay that will um, um, yeah, uh, sum up more of these observations uh, will soon be published in the book Coding and Representation from the 19th century to the present scrambled messages. Um, so maybe I yeah, keep, an, keep an eye on um, this publication. I'm going to stop screen sharing now and hope I left enough time for discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Manu. Uh, can everybody hear me? I hope so. Um, that was terrific. Uh, and thank you for sharing uh, in such details uh, some of those key aspects uh, uh, and, and the key moments of dreams uh, rewired. Um, as uh, if there are questions uh, from uh, you guys in the audience, uh, please uh, um, uh, post them in, in the chat. But as you do so, I'm going to perhaps start with some of my um, comments. Um, and of course, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in, uh, in uh, how digging into the archive uh, of uh, what is ultimately quite a recent past, uh, even though it looks so far away, but digging into the archive, it becomes a system, it becomes a strategy to really um, give us a perspective and also give us a, um, diagnostic tools, uh, also to um, think about uh, our present and our compulsion, our obsessions with technologies, and also perhaps uh, think about a, a multitude of, of potential different futures that we can craft. So my question here would be, as you were digging into the archives, uh, what was the, 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 you know, the key curatorial uh, um, sort of criteria that you were following? Because uh, I imagine you came across uh, a lot of formidable images and so, some, of, some of the images in, in, in the film are actually quite uh, astounding. And I have my personal list, um, including those two ladies in the street with their mobile wireless, uh, um, sort of picking up a street chatter. So how did you go about uh, curating uh, amongst so the huge archive sources uh, that, uh, that you, um, you, you work through. Uh, so this is really a good point, a good moment where I would like to credit my two co-directors, Thomas Tode and Martin Reinhardt. They um, started uh, the research in the film archives quite a few years before I joined the film team. And it was um, motivated by, uh, so in the early days it was motivated by this, by this question, how did sound and image um, find together? So we know this history of sound recording and silent film and there's a bit of a mythology around um, how suddenly in 1923 um, the film found its voice. Um, so, but as they started to just simply look at, at all and every recording, be it from newsreels, be it from fiction, be it from uh, scientific systematic recordings, um, be it advertisement, um, so across all genres, they, they were looking for our first encounter and relationship to media technologies. And that's how uh, we then saw like a, a different um, uh, theme um, smiling at us, so different urgent questions emerging. And um, um, so this was the moment when the film was stopped um, serving a historical purpose. Like, this question of sound and image. Mm. So uh, later when I joined those efforts, mm, yeah, it was really tricky to, um, uh, to go about it because you can't just 
type into a database, a keyword like um, overcoming distance. And to us, it was of equal interest to see, you know, which other um, narratives, fantasies, uh, metaphors uh, uh, did um, the, the creatives in film come up with in order to reflect what seemed to be up in the air, you know, this inevitable uh, conquest over distance and time. Oh, can't hear you. <laughs> Are there any questions or comments uh, um, from the audience? Uh, if you want to post them in the chat, please. Um, maybe we can start with, uh, thanks for your talk, by the way, Manu, fascinating. Um, we do have a couple of answers for your quiz. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so um, I can either share them in the chat or if you want to tell me what the number is and I can tell you who got it first. Which would be better? So Should I question, put it? Sorry, continue. Yeah. Maybe um, in case somebody joined late, the question was um, um, back then. Uh, we could transmit eight uh, words per minute on a telegraph, but it took nine days to send a steamer from New York to London. So how many words um, uh, could you send as a telegraph message in order for it to take as long as the steamer? And, um, and the right answer is in the hundred thousands and something let me just quickly find my notes i'm very excited about um, <laughs> um getting a few responses to this so um nine days is twelve thousand nine hundred sixty minutes so that times eight is hundred three thousand six hundred eighty words Okay, very good. Yeah, we have um, the first person to get that right was Zoe Horn. Um, and somebody else mentioned afterwards, uh, Kenzo repeated the number and he said that that's about a 300 page novel. So yeah, very, very good. Ooh, okay. Um, now I would need to... <laughs> translate 100,000 words into pages. <laughs> so thank you for your answers. And um, if you are interested in the film poster, then please let us know how we can, where we can send it or how to get in touch to yeah. <laughs> uh, make the arrangements. Yes, put your address in the chat, please. Thank you. Is there anything coming up or because I have another point. You jumped in, Betty. Um, watching, watching Dreams Rewired, I, I noticed uh, there are a lot of women populating the film and there are a lot of female bodies. So there, is, uh, there are incredible choreographies of uh, female uh, uh, hands uh, and, and fingers, uh, the body of the typist, uh, the bodies of the phone operators. Uh, um, there, are, there, are, there are a lot of women populating the movie. And at the same time, uh, there is a clear sense of how technologies always carry very um, um, hierarchical uh, politics with them. And again, I was wondering whether, um, did you manage to unhurt uh, any specific gender related issue in relation to technology in, in, in the building the movie. Because for instance, some of, some of the images of uh, women are quite uh, um, um, sort of ambiguous. They appear to be subservient uh, of technologies because they are employed as uh, uh, operators. But at the same time, uh, precisely because of that, they might gain some agency and become some sort of pioneer, pioneers of the field. Um, in particular, um, I, was, uh, I was really astonished. Uh, ast it was astonishing for me to, to hear that the first, uh, um, the first female uh, um, uh, movie director 
was uh, um, you, you show in, in the movie, um, it, there was the first of a, a building, a narrative, a narrative uh, film. So I wonder if you can tell us something about uh, the work in relation to technologies and gender in particular. Uh, yeah, I love to speak about this. So um, as a, a little girl, I was keen to learn about um, the history of um, all these technologies in our living room and all the books, all the answers that were available um, would provide me with uh, male protagonists in, um, from Edison to Bell to Marconi to what have you. So um, had, um, uh, had we aspired to retell the history of those who managed to hold the patents and turn ideas into a business, um, we probably would have ended up uh, replicating um, this um, impression that um, really it was um, mostly men being captured uh, by this uh, innovative spark of electricity and this new spirit at the time. However, um, having spent so much time with um, film material that, like I mentioned earlier, captured the whole, the whole range from entertainment to educational films to um, what have you, I could clearly see that women played a much more active role and um, um, not, not just like then later, let's say in the 50s, women are being portrayed as, um, as those who um, welcome electric devices into their lives, into their households with, um, they would be shown by men in a white coat, how this washing machine works that would then free up her time. But, um, um, so the ads in the 50s always emphasize, oh, dear housewife, don't worry, it's very easy to use, you know, <laughs> you can't make any mistakes. While back then at the turn of the century, for example, the film the footage that I found about um, uh, the beginnings of uh, wireless and also the Chrysler radio, uh, you would always see um, girls, women being part of that movement, uh, being part of those who picked it, who picked up these devices as something um, they um, anticipated to affect their lives, to yeah, enable them to expand their radios, to reach out um, to news, well, you know, imaginary neighborhoods. Um, I mean, having said that, of course, you would then also come across um, uh, diary entries or, or evidence that, for example, there was this story of a wireless um, operate, um, a, a girdle in the States um, that was also part of this um, wireless amateur community. I'm now really speaking about the Morse, um, um, the time when the Morse alphabet was used, not um, radio. And she would uh, choose to, to identify herself with a boy's name because she was uh, she had experienced that she would be left out from the chapter in the airwaves if she admitted that she was a girdle. So you can find this too. And then maybe to add one more um, aspect to your observation, um, that is that, uh, yes, indeed, um, new opportunities to leave the house, to take up work, um, a step towards independence, if you like, hmm? Um, opened up through the establishment of the uh, telephone centers. So in the film, you will see um, um, women. I actually showed a clip earlier that showed uh, women operating um, those centers. And all in a sudden, thousands of new employees were needed. Film, And then by splitting the work task of making a film, she introduced um, uh, this um, professional um, category of a film director. Because before that, 
we would speak of filmmakers, you know, somebody who, who really does everything, who might even perform in front of the camera um, or who travels with the camera and captures situations. But she um, would um, hire someone to look after the lights, someone to look after the costumes and the stage design and being the daughter of uh, a family that was running a bookshop in, uh, in Chile, um, actually, before they migrated to France. Um, yeah, so to her, stories had always played a very important role. And, um, but when she got married, um, she was asked to um, stop working as a film director. So this is not where her story stops, but maybe this is where my answer needs to stop in terms of time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we do have 10 minutes, uh, um, well, a little bit less. Um, um, is, if there is nothing, yes, there is something coming up. Yeah, so we have a question from Tom. Uh, he says, fascinating talk, though I haven't managed to see the film. Most of your examples of transmitted images were to do with family or romantic relationships. Were there other kind of events uh, and he goes on to say, such as things uh, people imagined for the use of these futuristic technologies. Sorry, people imagining. So he's asking um, whether example, any just could... any examples in the film, yeah, of ha what people were imagining for the use of these technologies. Um, so, uh, yeah, the the connection to family features a lot but to be honest it also features a lot in um, the early smartphone advertisements um, for example I so remember the Samsung uh, ad when it was broadcast before Christmas and it showed exactly the same scene like Edison's uh, um, fire um, brigade uh, having a night shift and missing his family so it was someone in a CCTV control center missing Christmas <laughs> and connecting with his smartphone to sing Merry Christmas together. So yeah, but really um, we see also a lot of examples, um, maybe more so in, um, in, the, in the novels and magazines and the caricatures um, connecting to opera. So it was really seen as um, the ultimate dream to, to watch an opera or um, a theater piece uh, from the comfort of your armchair. So you would always be in the first row, you could um, witness and participate. And later when, when uh, at the arrival of television, uh, we can see the same phrases being used that capture this magical experience. You don't have to leave your home. You can uh, witness the, for example, Olympics in the 30s from the comfort of your own armchair. Mm. Um, so yeah, um, kind of highbrow cultural events, but also um, sp sports uh, results were something um, of interest. And I'm just trying to think. Mm. And then of course this, um, yeah, relationship um, of a country either from coast to coast, west coast, west coast, uh, east coast, um, or to the colonies, more like in Europe, um, the exchange of news. So you feel you're one nation. Um, that kind of content was also transported in these um, narratives. So for example, the east coast would learn about the earthquake in San Francisco and feel they're one nation. Um, Thank you, Manu. Um, I do have a, another question from George. Uh, they say, great talk and great film. Just wanted to ask about the decision to use Tilda Swinton as the narrator of the film, and perhaps if her role in cinema and art history led into that decision. Oh, thank you for bringing up Tilda Swinton. Um, I was lucky enough to work with her before Dreams Rewired. Uh, she uh, provided the voiceover for my film Faceless, which 
again, um, consisted out of silent material. In that case, it was authentic CCTV recordings. So um, as I, you know, as the, as the film progressed and advanced in this triangular relationship between uh, the edit, the voice, or the, the writing of the voiceover, and um, the collaboration with the composer. Mm, I noticed how I imagined those words increasingly uh, delivered, not just by her voice, but also the, 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 the variety that um, uh, yeah, she can employ from more factual to satirical to, um, yeah, it was really fantastic working with her on this feature film um, and to see her play with the different roles that um, she was asked to sleep into. <laughs> Thank we you. have about uh, a minute left if you want to stay and to keep on time as we should. Is there anything coming in the chat? So maybe do yeah. time for one more. Yeah, we have one more question um, and then we can wrap up. So I have a message from either Lewis or Louise. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but they say, hi Manu, thank you for your talk. Uh, you have shown how humans have overcome distance and time with radio in brackets, sound, TV, image and drone strikes, touch, question mark. Uh, where will this connectivity develop next? Yeah. What, one minute answer. <laughs> um, um, well, I'm just catching up with the, the fungi scene. <laughs> there might be some interesting um, answers lurking around um, mycelium networks and the like. Maybe I'll leave it there. <laughs> That, that, that's wonderful and it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful ending and I really want to thank you Manu for being with us uh, generous with your time and ideas and, and your visual. Thank you Kay for facilitating. Thank you everyone behind the scene that made all this possible. Um, and before saying goodbye I just wanted to thank you all uh, um, you audience out there and a special message for our Santa St. Martin students. I know you're there um, and I want to let you know, keep checking the digital innovation website because uh, there are some new activities coming up. We're gonna launch a collaborative platform on Miro next week. You will receive a newsletter with uh, details on how to participate uh, and to really capitalize on uh, the workshop, the talks, uh, and, and building together a community of digital practice. In two weeks, there's going to be the second of the Hybrid Futures talks on the 25th of November with the critical designer David Benke. And stay tuned. And uh, thank you again for being with us. And uh, a very good rest of the evening. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.